This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at patreon.com slash the dig and by Verso Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for dig listeners like you. One that you might like is Our History is the Future, Standing Rock versus the Dakota Axis Pipeline, and the Long Tradition of Indigenous Resistance by Nick Estes. In 2016, a small protest encampment at the Standing Rock Reservation in North Dakota, initially established to block construction of the Dakota Access oil pipeline, grew to be the largest indigenous protest movement in the 21st century. Water protectors knew this battle for native sovereignty had already been fought many times before, and that, even after the encampment was gone, their anti-colonial struggle would continue. In Our History is the Future, Nick Estes traces traditions of indigenous resistance that led to the no-DAPL movement. Our History is the Future is at once a work of history, a manifesto, and an intergenerational story of resistance. I recently did a really incredible, in-depth, lengthy interview with Nick as well. You can find it at thedigradio.com. You should also really buy and read the book. Our History is the Future, Standing Rock versus the Dakota Access Pipeline, and the Long History of Indigenous Resistance by Nick Estes. Out now from Verso Books. Welcome to The Dig, a podcast from Jacobin Magazine. My name is Daniel Denver, and I'm broadcasting from Providence, Rhode Island. Sylvia Federici, as you likely know, is one of the most consequential feminist thinkers alive. Today's episode is an interview that I conducted with her last week on Caliban and the Witch, Women, the Body, and Primitive Accumulation. The book argues that the European witch hunt was critical to the rise of capitalism. The persecution of witches, she writes, was, quote, as important as colonization and the expropriation of the European peasantry from its land were for the development of capitalism. Primitive accumulation was not simply an accumulation and concentration of exploitable workers and capital. It was also an accumulation of differences and divisions within the working class, whereby hierarchies built upon gender as well as race and age, became constitutive of class rule and the formation of the modern proletariat. Women's bodies, Federici writes, under capitalism became like the factory, with the uterus a, quote, machine for the reproduction of labor. I met Federici in her Brooklyn apartment, which is packed, as you might suspect, with books and radical propaganda. Next year, I plan to return to interview her on Wages for Housework. Before we get this interview rolling, I'm asking you, the person listening to me speaking into your earbuds with strange podcast intimacy, to support this podcast at patreon.com slash the dig. This is my full-time job. It's my producer Alex Lewis's part-time job. I pay Jeff Brodsky for our music. I pay a professional producer to record each and every guest, which is why they sound so good, like they're in the same room as me, rather than on the phone, which is where they normally are. And because the purpose of this podcast is to provide all of our listeners all over the world with analysis that can help them make sense of the world in order to change it, we are very much dedicated to providing each and every episode for free to everyone with no paywall. We can only do that because those of you who can afford to support the podcast do so at patreon.com slash the dig. 
Plus, we have a lot of left-wing books to send you as a thank you for those of you who contribute at least $10 a month. The more money, the more books as a thank you, and so on. Right now, you're walking down the street, you are on your commute, perhaps stuck in traffic, you're on the treadmill, you're doing dishes, you're eating lunch, and you keep meaning to donate, but then forget. Please, make a point of contributing. I appreciate it immensely, and we quite literally depend on your support. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash the dig. Also, two quick notes about the interview. Talking to Federici, I refer to a sci-fi show involving a Mormon spaceship. I didn't mention the name of it, and I wanted to mention it now. That show is The Expanse. I really like that show. Also, I mentioned that a friend of mine wrote an article about Slater Mill in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, that discusses how workers there built their own clock to stop the bosses from ripping them off. In fact, my friend Joey Leneve de Francesco did not write about that in the article. I heard about it on one of Joey's Radical History tours. But I've linked to Joey's Jacobin article about the 1824 strike at Slater Mill. It was the country's first factory strike. And it was a strike led by young women. Thank you. And here's Sylvia Federici, a feminist theorist and longtime and deeply committed activist. She co-founded the International Feminist Collective in the early 1970s and helped found the Wages for Housework campaign. She is the author of many works, including The New York Wages for Housework Committee, Theory, History, Documents, 1972 to 1977, Revolution at Point Zero, Housework, Reproduction, and Feminist Struggle, Reenchanting the World, Feminism and the Politics of the Commons, and, of course, Caliban and the Witch, Women, the Body, and Primitive Accumulation, from Autonomedia. Sylvia Federici, welcome to The Dig. Ah, uh, thank you. I'd like to start with your overall argument in Caliban. Why did the rise of capitalism require a genocidal war against women? And why did it take the form of the mass persecution, torture, and murder of accused witches? Yes, that's a very powerful, important question. I've asked myself the question so many times. And uh, I'm not sure. I've tried to give the best answer from uh, you know analyzing all the the evidence that I could uh, you know collect. But there are still questions I have. But my 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 conclusion, my conclusion was that uh, the rise of capitalism that lasted particularly in terms of uh, this proto-capitalist class being able to assert its hegemony. It's a process that unfolded over at least two centuries. And uh, it was a process that cannot be understood only in terms of the analysis that has been given to us you know, by Marx where Marx sees that the condition for the rise of a capitalist economy you know, is uh, the separation of producers from the means of production, the land, and the creation of a wageless proletariat, of a propertyless proletariat, a proletariat who has to be transformed into wage worker. In a way, for Marx, this is the essence, but, uh, and I'm not disputing that, but I think that the picture is very incomplete 
you know, the rise of capitalism implied a transformation of every aspect of life, a transformation of every relation. As I wrote in the book, it is not sufficient to expropriate people from what they have, you know, to transform them, you know, into certain type of workers, to instill certain daily habit, to instill a certain discipline, so that the transformation that uh, the rise of capitalism was about, uh, brought about was far you know, more profound and extended you know, than we usually imagine. And uh, transforming the basic condition of the reproduction of daily life you know, was uh, the, one of the most fundamental step. And that meant transforming the condition of women. For example, one of the accusation most common, you know, one of the charges that was moved against women accused of being witches, right, was the charge of destroying life, particularly through all kinds of means, magical means, to prevent the process of conception, as well as to destroy life by killing children. And so, I've associated that, you know, I've tried to explain that, that, you know, the need to accuse women, right, to criminalize any form of control over procreation, the need to criminalize was very important for a capitalist class who was discovering the power of labor, was discovering the, the power that came from controlling a large population of worker, you know, a capitalist class that more and more understood that the wealth, accumulation of wealth does not depend only on uh, how much land is controlled, how much territory, but that makes human labor really the essence, you know, the essence of, uh, of wealth. Right? And so in that perspective, you know, begins to look at demography, natality, marriage, birth, all of that in a very new optic, you know, in a completely different optic, in a very utilitarian, no? because how many children then are born is, signifies how many workers uh, as a direct effect on the labor market, you know. Again, the accusation that comes, you know, under the label of witchcraft, you know, of excessive lust, copulation with the devil. I mean, I interpret that as, a, as a, an attempt to discipline, you know, a sexuality that more and more is seen as a danger, you know, a danger in terms of uh, work discipline, a danger in terms of maintaining difference in the class relation, right? So often the witch is the woman who entraps the man of a higher class. She is the proletarian woman who fascinates. Fascination is a word that is associated with the, with the vocabulary of the demonology. In fact, it's part of the vocabulary of the witch trial. Right? The woman fascinates, reduces under her power the man through her eyes, right? And uh, so... They were uh, even accused of stealing and collecting penises. Yes, and castrating men, of course. The castration of men is part of uh, the, the preventing conception, right? And so my understanding of the witch hunt, right, is that... Uh, it has to be placed into the context, right, of uh, the new disciplinary regime that comes into place, you know, with the rise of capitalism, a disciplinary regime that in order to impose new forms of labor, right, and more intense forms of labor, and also to rearrange the relation between women and men, you know, needs to conduct a war 
on many, many aspects of reproduction, you know, where the central subject were women. And um, clearly, there is an aspect of the witch hunt. There is an aspect of witch hunt that is the aspect that you know usually um, attracts most commentary, which is an heritage of previous myth, previous uh, folklores. For example, the image of the woman who flies in the sky, you no, know, uh, on top of animals at times, you no, know, is an image that precedes, you know, the the um, beginning of the witch hunt. It comes from, uh, you know, Germanic and and even from Mediterranean, from Mediterranean mythologies, right? For example, in um, 12th, 13th century in Europe, there was this idea of the hold of women in some Mediterranean area who fly at night, but they are benign. They are benign, they, you know, they come to visit you. If you are a peasant at night, you might leave some food out for them. It's part of a whole mythology. And um, also the, the women traveling through the sky, it's a part of a German mythology. And uh, then in terms of capitalism, so to me there is this, the question of, um, and, and the third element is that uh, attacking women's power. You know, the rise of capitalism comes with a major attack on communality. Communal, communal living was very strong throughout the Middle Ages. The feudal world, uh, the life of the peasantry, was a communal life. Agricultural work was done collectively. And this created very strong ties. Women, for, them, for instance, were not usually doing reproductive work separately from each other. If you washed, you washed once a month and you washed with other women. All over Europe, you can still see the signs of these collective ways of washing. You know, in many places, you still have the big, uh, the big cement tubs where women collectively washed, right? So that collectivity, you had festivals, you, everything, every aspect of life was collective. That was a great power. That was a great power. Think of it. In the 15th century, you have peasant wars. All over Europe, you have peasant wars. How could the peasantry wage war against the military class? against the feudal class. And then yet, it I think is the great communalism. Capitalism had to destroy that communal life in order to be able to prevail, in order to be, it had to individualize. Yeah? The whole process of disciplining you know, was a process of individualization of relation. You have a, my argument is that we need to expand the Marxian concept of enclosure. We don't have only the enclosure of land, you know, where the common land is fenced off, you know, but we also have an enclosure of the body in terms of prohibitions, right? In terms of uh, the government asserting its control over the body of women. We have enclosure of knowledge, for example. Many women accused of being witches were midwives, were healer, they were treating people on the basis of a very empirical knowledge, knowledge of herbs, also knowledge coming from the experience of having given birth, and uh, that knowledge had to be destroyed. With capitalism comes the institution of a medical profession that depends directly, controlled by the state, given a license by the state, right? So we have a multiple reason why the woman has to be disciplined. She has to be disciplined in her reproductive capacity, in her sexuality, in her power as a healer, as a care worker, as a healer, as a, a midwife. So, and uh, generally, her social power has to be undermined. 
women's exploitation under, under capitalism, you argue, is rooted in, quote, the sexual division of labor and women's unpaid work. That unpaid work is social reproduction mm -hmm. work, a social economic activity that, that makes workers but is represented as not work. And so women's oppression, you write in turn, is facilitated by that labor being mystified as mm -hmm. nature. Mm -hmm. Explain this dynamic relationship and why the expropriation of women's bodies becomes so critical to the ascendance of capitalism. Yeah, it becomes ascendance, for example, by criminalizing. I mean, by criminalizing every form of contraception, right, the state controls the process of procreation. By criminalizing, for instance, the independent midwife, right, by, by changing the process of birthing, which usually was very communal, women gathered together, etc., making birthing and procreation now under the control of the state, the control of the doctor, etc. Right? It's it's a whole basically I think the moment we see from a capitalist optic, right, the human being as labor, as labor power, then the body of the woman is a machine, a machine for the production of workers. And I think that that is extremely important. And then the question of sexuality, right? Sexuality is a great power. I mean, remember what Plato says in the symposium, right? If you could only have an army of lovers, that army would be invincible because they would all, no lover would mind dying for the other one rather than appearing a coward in the eyes of the person you love. It's love, love erotic attraction, is a power that always takes you beyond yourself. It's, it's the great anti-individuality. Mm? It's the great communizer, you know, we always go beyond our life. It wins, it wins death. So a person who is fascinated and so on, right? It's a, uh, not so easily be controlled. So controlling sexuality and making sure that sexuality is only channel, you know, directed to the channels that are productive, which is birthing, marriage, procreation, the family, housework. It's very, very important, right? This is a society, I mean, I think important to understand capitalism. No? Capitalism begins, we ca capitalism, I think, represents a break with many previous systems of exploitation. It's, it's a break from looking at nature as well, so looking at land to looking at labor. And that's a major, I think we, we are not realizing enough. It has taken me, I, I now f understand that like capitalism has a constant contempt for the body and, and for and for nature and for the land, right? Everything is industry. Everything is industry. They can allow, for example, the body to stay as it is. The body has to be developed. The body is to be transformed, to be made productive. It's always like mining the body for new powers. And I think that the control of a women's life is very much you know, is essential to, to create a work machine, a work machine where the reproduction of the worker and the reproduction in particular ways, a reproduction which is also a disciplining at the same time. Because not only reproducing a person so that they are alive from one morning to the next, but they are more easily exploitable, have new capacities, uh, have been made more docile, like Foucault speaks about it. I don't think Foucault goes far enough. I don't think that Foucault sees enough of that process. Right? He speaks uh, right, of the army and he speaks of, 
of course, of the prison, but it doesn't see all the discipline that takes place at the level of reproduction. You know, the building of the nuclear family, for example, the criminalization of prostitution, the, the creation of a certain type of woman, right? the sacrificial woman, the woman who is modest, who has to be subordinate to men, who cannot talk, who is uh, considered literally, right? She has to live in the function of reproduction. Mm -hmm. And she is so not expected to enjoy any limited autonomy. You know, basically, she is really the condition of existence of the worker. Mm -hmm. A virtuous mar mar yeah, martyr. Exactly. So that to me, it's the construction is the change that capitalism brings in the relationship. Of course, utilizing also elements from previous forms of patriarchal rule, but also changing, changing the, the goal of the patriarchal rule and also some of the modality of patriarchal rule. You write, quote, capitalism as a social economic system is necessarily committed to racism and sexism. Yeah. For capitalism must justify and mystify the contradictions built into its social relations, the promise of freedom versus the reality of widespread coercion, and the promise of prosperity versus the reality of widespread punery. Bye. By denigrating the nature of those it exploits, women, colonial subjects, the descendants of African slaves, the immigrants displaced by globalization. My question is, why is it, it's kind of a basic question, but an important one, why is it that capitalism requires the creation of divisions and differences? And then why is it that people are differentiated according to their purported nature? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, I think that capitalism has, uh, you know, first of all, it's a system has not developed complete in its beginning, but has also de developed itself, you know, through a long process of adjustment and struggles and so on. For instance, uh, Jean Moulier, who is uh, a French activist sociologist, very important. Uh, he has written a, a book, a very, very important book, and he, he argues in that book that the main role of the capitalist class was not free labor. Actually, that wage labor was not free labor. And in fact, he has analyzed the 17th, almost to the 18th century, showing that for capitalism, the first conception of wage labor was uh, coerced wage labor. For example, he's right. In England, throughout the 17th century, you were not allowed to leave uh, your village. You could only, you had to work where you were told to work. The majority uh, of migrants yeah. to, the U, to, to North America in mm -hmm. the 17th century, I was just looking at statistics, mm -hmm. were in various forms of unfree Absolutely. labor. Absolutely. Unfree labor was really very, very widespread. And uh, in fact, uh, even to move from your village, you had to, you have to have a kind of a passport. What we saw in South Africa was really common throughout Europe. Now, it's only because of a lot of struggle than uh, the freedom of labor. So it's showing that the freedom of labor was not a capitalist invention. Capitalism was forced to give people the possibility to refuse a job or the possibility to change a job, that alternatively, had there not been struggle, and that this actually becomes common only around the 18th, 19th century, late 18th and century. But until then, wage labor is coerced, right? So I think that this is very important to keep in mind that also capitalism, when we speak of capitalism, we also speak of a system that has been changing in response to, to struggle. Take another example, the case of slavery. 
In fact, I, I, um, there's been all this discussion now about 1619, right? The, the fact that this is the year when uh, Africans arrive in the United States, arrive in Virginia for the first time. And somebody pointed out that when they came, actually, many Africa could even own land. Because often many African came and for a long time they were like indentured servants. It is only in the mid 1600s then you have the big, the slavery proper begins. As right? Barbara Fields right. writes about. Some people say after the Bacon Rebellion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because before the Bacon Rebellion, there was a lot of common struggle between whites and blacks. And be after the Bacon Rebellion, it was so threatening that they had to separate. And so the less and less the whites are indentured servants. The whites begin to get all the privileges. And so they, they actually, the separation of the status, the differentiation becomes, right? So my argument is in a way, a, built upon those examples to say that in order to maintain, to be able to perpetuate such an unjust exploitative society and to impose such a intense forms of exploitation like slavery, etc., right? Capitalism develops this elaborate system, you know, these hierarchies of labor. So, you know, with the white wage worker on top and then, you know, unpaid housewife and then those who are enslaved and even within slavery because the enslaved women, you know, have a particular regime. They become breeders. Virginia was a colony, of, there was a breeding industry. Women, Jefferson opposed the import of Africans from Africa because he wanted to defend. It was a protectionist measure for the breeding industry that was developing in Nigeria. It had nothing to do with humanitarian. Okay, so the point, the, the, the argument that I'm making is that those hierarchy were important. And this, if you want, is the geniality of capitalism that it sold itself as a democratic system because there is a layer of worker who seem to have, right, basically, who seem to work on the basis of an exchange, you know, which we know is not a fair exchange because they are propertyless and the other partner is not. But nevertheless, it has an idea of equality. But the moment you leave the strata of white wage worker, then it's different forms of coercion. And uh, in that way, you know, that's what I'm saying. The wage has been an instrument to cover up, right? To cover up, you know, the, the hierarchy, the violence, the racism. So how do you justify that? How do you justify the you have You justify the saying that you are, these people are morals, these people have not the same capacity, that they don't suffer when you whip them. I mean, there's a whole, when you read, the, it's like reading the demonology, reading the textbooks of, you know, racial justification, right? There's hundreds of reasons that are given or appealing to. Mm -hmm. So you blame the women, the women have no brain, they cannot be, they cannot control their passion. So you build a whole ideology to justify what in fact is, right, forms of, the most cruel forms of exploitation. So it's, it's very convenient, you know, you have, to, you have to have a racist ideology and a sexist ideology to explain why in a system they pretend to be democratic, you actually have continuously coercive forms of labor. How does this analysis relate to and depart from, I suppose, more conventional Marxist analyses that see the see wage labor and its double freedom of the freedom to work or the, and the freedom or the freedom to starve as as what makes capitalism distinct if it's not that relationship what it, what is it that distinguishes capitalism as a mode of production 
Well, I, I see to me the problem with, with the classical Marxist analysis is oh, the whole play takes place around wage labor. All the rest is in a shadow. Yeah, there's a big shadow over colonialism, over uh, sla- you know, the work of the slaves. Uh, women's work, of course, is ignored, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we really now have developed a analysis of racism, colonialism, coloniality, not only colonialism as an historical phenomenon, right, but coloniality as a, a necessity, a necessary structure of capitalist society, racist, colonial. We have that in from recent years, relatively, from the anti-colonial struggle. It's the anti-colonial struggle who has actually brought back all these forms of work and placed them at the center of capitalist accumulation, placed them at the center as a central necessity of the history of capitalist accumulation, right? You don't have that with Marxism. And, you know, it's a very, I'm, uh, the, one of the work I want to do, because I, I'm really develop, beginning myself to, I don't pretend that my work is, is exhaustive, you know, it's, uh, there's still much work to be done, but in a conference not long ago, one of these conferences for the Marxist uh, anniversary, the anniversary of Capital, this young Italian guy gave a presentation, which I found very, very interesting. He traces the, 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 the moment in which basically wage labor becomes for the Marxist too, labor. The moment of the equation between wage labor and labor to the beginning of the 19th century. In other words, that let's say until 1800, when you look at the radical imagination in Europe, right, and you look at, I don't know, the, the diggers, right, the, the Buenarotti, the insurrection of the equals, and so on is always the land, the people, the food riots. It's, it's a whole multitude of rebel subjects. It's a multitude of rebel subjects who are the, the subject of the revolts, the revolution, and so on, as well as wage workers. Then something happened around uh, the, the first decades. By 1840, already, the proletariat, the communist movement, is the wage work and all the others begin to disappear. And uh, his argument is that the great moment of transition is in the 1830s. Particularly, he, he thought, for instance, that uh, the big insurrection in Lyon, the, who were not even wage workers, they were self-employed, but, they've, but uh, so there's a big insurrection, the last, in fact, they controlled the city in Lyon, and but they didn't know what to do with it. They didn't know once they had the city in their hand for days, they didn't know what to do. And then they called back, they basically called the, 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 the institution to, they deliver the power that they had received, that they have won over the employers, over the merchants. They basically deliver it to the government. But in any case, he thinks that out of that begins a process of negotiation between representative of workers' organization and the government that says, okay, you will have certain rights, but only for this class of people. That's his analysis, I don't know. That basically his argument is that sometimes between 1830 and 1850, something happened that uh, it's like a, a contract where the state accepts to recognize workers' rights, but within very limited perimeter. And that the radical, the working class organization the union, the beginning union, accept that deal. And more and more accept that uh, the struggle, the class struggle, will take place in this more limited terrain. That's very much in sync with your argument about how the patriarchy yeah. of the wage 
functions. Begin, yeah, and then to begin a sense, yeah, and then to the, compensate the, male workers yeah, for the loss yeah. of the commons by their mm -hmm. yeah. control over women. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the home. So there, there is a whole the women. There is a whole world that begins to recede, and struggle. They begin to recede. That and so the new movement, the union movement, the communist movement. They are not concerned with the mul multiplicity of radical subjects who in previous decades had still been very important. You know, the women assaulted the, 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 the what do you call the cults, they were going to the post, you know, and took the sex, assaulted the, the oven, the public oven to take the bread, right? The, the occupation of land, the commons, all of all that world is not considered path, is riffraff. It's, you know, not riffraff, but... Ephemeral. Yeah. Or yeah. not ephemeral, um, marginalia. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It begins to disappear from the radical discourse. Stepping back, we, we were discussing yeah. a bit earlier about how capitalism relies on making these these distinctions and those who are in denigrated categories are denigrated mm -hmm. because of their nature. Mm -hmm. well, my question is, what about nature? Is it constructed nature itself? Of but but what it, what is nature being the the metaphor uh -huh. to legitimate these relationships of domination? Right, the nature means immutability. Means there's nothing you can do about it. To me, nature when you naturalize something, it's a, it's a death sentence in a way. It's a sentence to infinity. You cannot change it. And what does that, that tell us about the relationship yeah. between capitalism's relationship to actual non-human nature, like nature, nature? Uh -huh. Yeah, it's a very uh, absolute thing, only as a ground of exploitation, but it's a completely de disvalorization. Capitalism devalue completely is not nature; it's industry. In fact, it kept, that begins the great counterposition, right? Nature versus industry. You even have it now. In fact, I think now, now we are living that contrast to the maximum. I mean, you, 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 they, there's nothing you can live. They can live as it is, right? In fact, there's a whole literature that I began to read because I'm very interested in about what's the capitalist idea about the transformation of the body in the future, and so there's a whole literature that says. The capitalism really wants to go beyond the body. The, the futurologists, those who look at maybe a hundred years from now, they see the need to go beyond the human body. The human body is an impediment now to the development of a technology for which the human body is less and less appropriate. The human body comes from millions of years of construction and it's so backward from the point of view of a capitalism that is thinking maybe production in space. And the human body is poorly equipped to spend a year in space. You lose the bones, you lose the this. Moreover, you now have machines that are that requires a whole a so speedy they would require a refurbishing of the human brain. So there's all plans for putting microchips that expand the capacity for memory, expand the capacity, for example, that people could read a book in 20 minutes. Why spend a whole day or three days reading a book? Let's say you could read a book in, in three hours, or you could accumulate so much more knowledge this is one example of a capital long, long battle against the human body to make a human body that is, you know, apt to be exploitable to the kind of technology, etc. So the first you have the body with the lever, with the this, right? The mechanical philosophy. Right, the mechanical body. And now, of course, Descartes. it's the electronic. The body has to fit into electronic program that for which is very poorly equipped, right? Already, you have a whole population of people who cannot, including myself. Now, we elderly, 
go around the world that is becoming more and more difficult to manage because you have all this technology and it's not, I mean, if I, you know, have the repulsion <laughs> towards them, for example, to use machine to buy a ticket. And I know that I cannot, I cannot, right? I already see built in me resistances, for example, to go to a machine and ta 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 I see children can do it, and I know I know that I'm not so stupid that I cannot do it. But you'd prefer to talk but to I, the teller. I, yes, I prefer to go to the teller. Right? I, I feel so much resisted in myself. And this is exactly, you know, what they have to break. They feel that there is so much inertia eh, to, to change. So like putting the microchips here, putting the microchips there, that's their conception. They're, and they are doing it, right? You already have these people who, who are very proud. They can go into a bank just doing this. Well, how, how do we get from this point that you talk about in Caliban of, of mechanical philosophy and these corporeal hierarchies right. that, that are developed? You, you write that they make the body into a machine right. subject to, quote, a new bourgeois spirit that calculates, classifies, right. makes distinctions, and degrades the body only in order to rationalize its faculties, aiming not just at intensifying its subjection, but at maximizing its social utility. How do we get from Absolutely. this point where the body becoming a machine disciplined by the rational brain, I guess, from that point to a point where the body is today, what you're describing is seen as a woefully inefficient machine that well, needs to be transcended. It's a machine. It's still a machine, right? Except that now it's a machine that has severe limits. For instance, well, you know, going to Mars is going to be very difficult in terms, if you come back, what, what is going to happen to your bone structure? As long as you have a body that has a bone structure that loses minerals, etc. That that is the question. I wrote the piece actually with George. I wrote the piece. I, I'm I'm right putting together a book now called Beyond the Periphery of the Skin, and I'm I'm revising and republishing that article, which was called Mormons in Space, Mormons in Space, and this an article that we wrote in the eighties when there was a lot a lot of talk about building colonies in space and production in space. You're too young, you don't remember, but there was a lot of talk and all the advantages of producing in space. And we wrote an article responding to that. It had many, many points. I think it was an important article. We were saying, well, what they're interested in is not only the kind of new metal, because they were talking about the new metals, but producing without gravity is going to produce metals that are going to be so much more solid because the, the absence of gravity allows combination anyway. We said the real thing is what you do to workers in space. Because when you have them all covered up like this, class struggle is very reduced. And we already noticed that when they were talking about the workers in space, they always had in mind a certain type of worker very ascetic, very con no, body, no, no, no bodily worker. You know, the one who drinks, you know, eats pellets, drinks urine recycle, no sex, no fights, no wine, no this. We thought about the Mormons. <laughs> There's but, a sci-fi show that's uh -huh. based around, um, that has a massive Mormon spaceship in uh, it. I'll, I'll I'll send it to you later. <laughs> oh, do please, yeah, because yeah, they were talking always funny. about the Mormons, yeah. and we thought they talk about the Mormons because it's, in their mind, they, they represent an ideal worker who can be in space and not beyond set. So that's the notion of a body. They now, their vision of where they would like to go, it's transcend the capacity of the bodies that they see around. When they look at us, they, I don't think they're very happy. <laughs> is that a rupture with the yeah. mechanical philosophy or is it a continuation no, of its ultimate? it's a continuation. It's that the machine is changing. Now the kind of machine 
why a spaceship why is different from a factory. Imagine if you have to live in a spaceship is different from a not a factory. They require different kinds of, dis of workers, of abilities and disciplines. You know, not a fact you can still have a work of gas of beer at night and so on. You cannot do that if you are up in space, right? Or if you are on a trip to Mars, dealing with very precious billions of dollars in those instruments. One mistakes and everything blows up. You can have a fight in space. I don't know if you can fuck in space, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> I don't think, yes. You can purge that. No, we we uh, <laughs> we encourage cursing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well that's uh, exactly because that's exactly I think what they have in mind. You know, what if you are one year in space? You know, then then uh, hmm. almost then the prison becomes a model. Ah, the prison was a perfect model. The prison was a perfect model for the factory. In fact, the workhouse was the model. The plantation was a model because there is a lot of misconception that the plantation were very backward. They were not agriculture. The organization of the plantation was very factory-like. I think it's beginning the, the, the plantation, the slave plantation. You, you write that in the 16th century, yeah. European states erected this new system of public assistance yes. alongside criminalizing Right. The working class. That's right. Which, referring, you mentioned this earlier in the interview, it was this process of social enclosure. Right. That, that both privatized reproduction, mm -hmm. but also put it under state. Exactly. Exactly. Management. It, explain the rise of this, this carceral public welfare system and how it functioned alongside land enclosure to yeah, discipline the peasantry. Because it, well, I think it, it comes for for but basically is an anti riot system right it's basically for the whole population growing population of people who are not included into the wage relation and you have the mendicants the poor the beggars the those etc and on one side is a response to struggle and on the other, it's also the idea, and the children of the poor, oh God, the children of the poor, they are like the great wealth. Now imagine, take them away from their house and put them to work into these places that are supposed to support them, but they are really like the workhouse, right? You reproduce them obviously at the smallest level and you also um, you, you reproduce them, you discipline them, and you make them work. All three, because you have to... So, for example, there is a beautiful book by two Italian, uh, Melossi and Pavarini, which is called The Prison and the Factory. It's a perfect book. And they show, in fact, the relationship between these forms, you know, these... Um, the workhouse and the rise of the and the, this, the prison also how the modern factory how much the modern factory owes to the old workhouses in which you had poor people who were hanging around the streets the children of the poor and uh, they are pretty much everywhere like in the Netherlands in England and he has a description, for example, of the workhouse in the Netherlands. They will have vagabonds. They will round them up, they put them in, and then they would have them do jobs like cutting these big trunks of trees and uh, making pulp of them, making brittle things of them, you know. And they had more equipped machine to do it, but they would have them do it manually. They would have them do it manually because it was like a discipline. It was not only using their labor to get the job done. It was also disciplined them to work and to work under strenuous condition, you know, 
So they, they could have actually gotten those, the, that pulp done in more efficient and less painful way. But apparently, there was a pedagogical purpose as well. It was well. a pedagogical purpose. Apparently, it was very, very painful. They would almost break your kidneys to, to do all the very heavy work. But there was a point in doing that, you know. So the workhouse was a place of exploitation. It was a place of incarceration, taking you away from the public space where you could be rioters. It was a place of using your labor. It was a place teaching you to a discipline, disciplining you to become a worker, right? I, w I want to step back briefly and talk about what this was all in reaction mm. to, because you write that capitalism was not an inevitable economic no, outcome no. from the feudal economy, but rather right. a political economic reaction of the feudal elite right. against a centuries long peasant revolt. Right. And that capitalism's victory destroyed another possible world. Another possible world, yeah. That peasant revolutionaries are fighting a peasant, for. Peasant and artisan. Yeah. These are the two great movements, right? Because uh, on one side, you have the peasant struggle in the in the rural area from England to Spain to France, you know, basically people reappropriating land and taking over land. And uh, on the other hand, Germany, the peasant were in Germany. And on the other hand, you have all through the, for example, culminating in the 15th century, you know. And this, of course, in the rural area, these are the struggles that are putting an end to slavery. And they are creating a labor crisis. And in the urban area, you have the artisan. Now, the artisan, the guild structure was very hierarchical because you had the big guild, the big artisan, but these were the merchants. They were rich people. They were the proto-capitalists. They were the ones, the landowner, the merchants, right? But what used to be called the small arts. These were like artisan workers, you know, who were doing the cloth workers, the weavers, and so on, right? They were what becomes the wage worker. Right? For example, the weaver, and the spinners, and uh, they are insurrecting all the time. There's many, many insurrection. Insurrection, in some cases, they were able to take power for a number of days. In Ghent, I talk about the you know workers' democracy, where you have the the, the minor arts taking over the town. A proto-commune. Yeah, a proto-commune, yeah, in, in the 15th century. You, I, I speak, that's one of my theories, okay? That's the, one of the theories that, that the capitalism is a counter-revolution. The counter-revolution, and as a counter-revolution, it also creates a whole new system of labor, a new system of social relation, and also new type of labor, because, for instance, the idea that you work all day at the same job the, whether you are a weaver, for example, you weave for eight hours or seven hours, that was unheard of. That was torture. It is torture. People did a little weaving, and then they, they had a piece of land, and they went into the garden, and they did something, and then, I don't know, maybe they sewed the nets because they might also go to fish something. In other words, the idea, not until... Not until the 18th, 19th century, you really have, not until the 19th century, you have that idea of continuous work. And then by 19, 1900, when they, in Europe they introduced electricity, then begins the penalty of, of night work. Because by 1900, you know, you be, they can work all the evening because light, electricity, introduces the possibility of night work. Which liberates yeah. time as sort of the right. individual unit exactly. of seconds and minutes from the yeah. rhythms this of night This is again of going beyond nature, nature, right? Yeah. Now, well, the season is another way of going mm -hmm. beyond nature. The season are not regulating the pace of work and the time of work. So it used to be that the time was marked by the bell of the church, the morning and the evening, right? Then you have the clock. By 1500, you begin to have in the major cities of Europe the introduction of the clock. The clock is already a very abstract time. 
that is not connected to any particular event. You know, with the clock, it comes a time that could be anything. Four o'clock, it could be night, it could be day, it could be whatever. Right? There's a story that I, I need to send you that a friend of mine wrote about in Pawtucket, Rhode Island, uh-huh. near right outside of Providence, where the first mill in the U.S. Yeah. opened, Slater Mill. Workers raised money to put up a big clock huh. to take some control back from mill yeah. owners who were using the fact that they had privileged access to Mm-hmm. To clocks, to, time, to steal, time, to steal right. their. Or- of course, then of course, yeah, the workers want the time because they know that that's an instrument of control. The time is, yeah, and and uh, so the transformation, the reorganization of time. If that's one of the things that I want to, I, I really want to write about time, because this is something that I've been really interested in. And I collected for a long time. I was preparing to write something about time. I collected a lot of material about the changing how. Time, work, and the class struggle, and how that affects also the question of reproduction. This is something that I've, I hope I hope that I have enough time to write that. Stepping back historically a little, sure. you identify the heretics, mm-hmm. a, a peasant movement that denied that mm-hmm. God spoke through the clergy. Mm-hmm. Peasant I, and artisan too, urban too, urban. You identify that as a political precursor to yes. the peasant revolt. Mm-hmm. And I think also it's violent suppression as a precursor to the, to the witch, witch hunts. hunts. Yes. Um, thousands of accused mm-hmm. heretics were burned at the stake. Right. It, explain why heresy was, quote, the equivalent of liberation theology yeah. for the medieval proletariat. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, there are different types of heresy. And there is a, a tendency to always look at heresy, even, even in general. I think that people have not, have been, we have been so indoctrinated to think that religion is something separate from politics, social life, and the organization of social life, and from politics. That's a very recent historical yeah, distinction. <laughs> very recent. And, and people, and you know, I think that this, this, this idea, you know, of, um, bourgeois democracy, the separation of state and church, it's a farce. It's a real, it's really uh, the separation of state and church because in fact we see the state and church have been manipul- working with each other very, very, very well, constantly, all through. Even now we see it, right? So when I talk about the witch hunt, people say, but what about the church? Yeah, and I say, but the church was part of the power structure. When I talk at the power structure, you know, the church is part of the power structure. But in terms of the erratic movement, so the erratic movement, right? People think of the erratic movement is that people who deny certain particular element of the creed. The erratic movement was a movement that was uh, against the church, against the that old religious machine, and it was against the creed in the way it was used because it was used by the church as an instrument of exploitation. Because they claimed a privileged right. relationship exactly. to divine knowledge exactly. and authority. Exactly, exactly. And, and what, and what they, 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 the kind of vision of what God said, you know, was so exploitative. And so... So the heretic movement, you have the Valdensian, you have the Cathar. They had a different conception of religion, but it was different conception. They had deep social implications, right? For example, they said the church should not own property. Christ didn't have property, so the church should not, right? Why, et cetera, et cetera. They said many that each person has a spark of the divine. And so the whole idea that we are sinners and, and the, 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 the devil, et cetera, et cetera, and, and uh, the original sin, but they rejected that. So they said the nudity, like the Adamites, the nudity is not sinful, right, for instance. And the nud- they had all sorts nudity, of yeah. heterodox Mm-hmm. sexual and gender practices Absolutely. that were seen yeah. as a core to their threat. Yeah, and then also they allow women to 
Um, the Carter, for example, allowed women to administer the sacraments. So they didn't think the women were an inferior species, right? So the heretic had a social agenda that was anti-authoritarian, that was anti-property, right? And uh, rejected the way the church used you know, is, uh, you know, religion to control the body, control sexuality, control the management of wealth, and particularly the inequality, the justification of inequality. You know? And this is why they were persecuted. You trace the status of, of women over the centuries, in part through the history of prostitution. Yeah, yeah. You write that in the 14th and 15th century, the expansion of brothels mm -hmm. was a means for elites to diffuse protest mm -hmm. from below. By contrast, mm -hmm. in the 16th century, yeah, it's great. Yeah. it was the criminalization of prostitution right. and the right. persecution of sex right. workers that was a means to force women mm -hmm. from the public sphere. And then ultimately, prostitutes become portray portrayed as witches in the making, mm -hmm. the youthful precursor right, to the elderly the witch. witch. Right. It, explain this broad trajectory that you draw, Trace, here, and, and how the organization of sex work mm -hmm. reflected and shaped the crisis in feudalism and then the rise mm -hmm. of capitalism. Right. I, I trace different moments right, of uh, the, the life of the prostitute, of the place of prostitution, in that, you know, in a sense, I, I trace like three moments, right? A moment of transition in capitalism and before. And it's very clear that throughout the Middle Ages, the prostitute does not have a high position, but it's, it's recognized. It's, it's recognized as a, necessary, as a necessary place, as a necessary job that is not meritorious, but it's necessary. Right? because of concupiscence. It's the male concupiscence that the, the sexual desire is stronger in men, et cetera, et cetera, and so it has to be given an outlet, and so the prostitute is there. She's a reproductive worker. In fact, the ideology of prostitution sounds very much like what you know, some prostitute organization today you know, will be saying that this is a social service. So in the Middle Ages, prostitutes would be asked maybe to wear certain things that would distinguish them, but their presence was very much tolerated, was most often they would be part of public ce ce celebration, et cetera, et cetera. They were not the outcast or the criminal. Then you come, comes a moment, what I, what I describe, it was not so much prostitution. Yeah, there's an interesting moment around the 1400, right, when prostitution has a lot of uh, jobs to do, you know, partially has to do with uh, the fear of homosexuality, very strong after the Black Death, the threat of depopulation, you know, all big crisis. Which also increased peasant power exactly. by decreasing, exactly. tightening the labor yeah. market. And so you, particularly in Italy and in some parts of Italy where, where you had the, the, the homosexuality was a very, very broad practice and accepted places like Firenze, for instance. Uh, so the brothel becomes... And by 1500, 1400, 1500, this, this is now a preoccupation because there is a whole fear that, uh, of depopulation. After the, the Black Death, there is a fear, whereas previously homosexuality is condoned, is tolerated, and in many cases very openly practiced. Afterwards, restrictions are introduced. And the brothel is also encouraged as an alternative. And also the brothel and uh, also the, the raping of young proletarian women is also allowed as a safety valve 
you know, for rebellious artisans, journeymen, etc. But comes the 16th century, all of that is, is now changed. And I think it has to do with the massification of prostitution also. That is also a big thing. Lots of women now enter the street, right? Villages are enclosed. Vagabonds, so you have the vagabond and the prostitute becoming common features in the streets, in, in, the, in the cities, and so on. And, uh, and then it's decriminalized. And right. the vagabond is targeted yeah. by the, the workhouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the vagabonds go to the crystal and the prostitute is terrorized. They cut their nose, they put them into these uh, cages and they plunge them into, they treat them as witches, right? So the prostitute is now persona, it becomes more and more it's associated, you know, it's driven underground. Is the persecution of yeah. prostitutes coterminous with the witch hunts, or does? Oh yeah, yeah. It begins the 16th century. 16th century, yeah. yeah, yeah, very much. The pact with the devil is the devil gives the money to the woman, right? I describe the way the pact to the devil is described in the demonology. Usually, is the woman has no money. The woman is desperate. Usually, the devil appears when she is down, you know, on her luck. And says, right? hey. And she says, oh, my God, what am I going to do? And then he appears and says, aha, I'm here. Do I have a deal for you? <laughs> yeah, I have a deal for you. And he usually gives us some money, which then turns into ashes. It's always interesting why it turns into ashes. But then he gives us some money, and then he, has, he copulates with her. So that's a classical... I say it's marital, it's prostitute. It says women taking money for sex is bad. Women taking money is bad. There is a right there in that image, there is a demonization. In fact, I want to write a piece like women, money, and the devil. And look at the history of women to money in capitalism and to show how it has been criminalized and demonized. And it begins with that image. All the way through welfare reform. All, all through the, exactly, ex, that's exactly my point. Yeah. Women, money, and the devil. Yeah, the welfare woman is the prostitute, or the welfare king, the criminal, the drug addict, the woman who has a dysfunctional family, the mother of a, of a, of a, of a youth that has to be put in jail because it was... Their youth was never taught good good morals. Or you look at sort of neo Malthusians yeah. like Garrett Hardin, yeah. who I've been researching for yeah. my book on immigration politics, yes. and the case against sort of aid, yes. like the idea that you're just in, uh, subsidizing pathological reproduction. Exactly, pathological a dysfunctional family, which has to do then with drugs and with uh, you know crime. Yeah, exactly, and it begins with this pact with the devil, the woman who takes the money from the devil. And instead, she should make love, you know, not without knowing it, right? Closing your eyes, not knowing what is happening, letting the man use her body with the eyes closed. That was the idea, right? Not sexual at all. Giving your body as a service, not a pleasure for yourself. And here's a woman instead taking money for it, right? So there's a whole, there's a whole history. There's a whole... <laughs> Yeah. Before we get any further, it, explain the, the scope and scale of the witch hunt mm -hmm. in Europe and also its manifestation in, in the so-called New World. Why it reached its climax at the mm -hmm. moment of the transition from feudalism to capitalism. And more concretely, because we I think a lot of people probably presume that it was this kind of mass populist hysteria, mm -hmm. but more concretely, how it was that that the witch hunt as as an elite led institution managed to turn poor men mm -hmm. against poor women mm -hmm. there's so much work to be done there's so much work to be done and and uh, you know i hope i have great hope i don't know if it's but in spain at least we have begun to organize you know study groups of women were now going into the archives. We have about 30 study groups 
in Spain. Yeah, mm -hmm. 30 study group, yeah. That are, are begun, and we had the first Congress in Pamplona just in March of this year. And we had more than 100 women in the diff with the different groups collecting the first, the first results, right? Because I think there's a lot of knowledge we don't have. I say this in relation to the question of who accuses whom, because it seems, I think there's a case that can be made that the majority of accusation came from people of a higher position rather than people at the same level, although there's also a lot of accusation. Because when you have a, you, when you have a, a persecution the last three centuries, it's very important to see that in the course of that time, when the idea that this criminal exists sinks into the population, then you also have people in the same community using it. People in the same communities as the women who are accused using it. So what I'm trying to say is that the witch hunt really begins from above, begins from those they, they have against the have-nots. Over time, in the course of three centuries, when a certain psychosis, and it's like the terrorist. Now, an employer whose work has gone strike and say, oh, they're all terrorists. Right now, the, the accusation of you can also have people who, who necessarily have much more power making charges. Oh, immigrants, they are all terrorists. So I think that's very important. Without, w w without recognizing the fundamental implication of, say, imperial war making in uh -huh. the existence of yeah. the category of terrorism. Yeah, exactly. In the first exactly, place. exactly. You know, who, because when you look at the way the, the witch hunt develops, it always develops from above. It's the institution, right? It's the church, the, 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 lo the local authority, it's the government, it's the king who basically says there is a new crime. We, you know, often they say it's a new crime, switches, etc., etc. Everybody that knows of the existence of a witch has to come forward and denounce it. Otherwise, there will be. This is what, this is what is being proclaimed publicly. So it's very clear, uncontestable, that there comes from from above, right? That there, there is an edict that is made. So that's very important, I think. In terms of the size, uh, there is huge speculation. Right? So people have begun counting. I think the counting is about more than 100,000, right? which is very small compared to what was claimed before. But the number is unbelievably higher. I don't know, not in the million, but certainly much higher than what has been counted because a lot of those were not recorded and uh, a lot of archives have been destroyed. A lot of places have not been studied yet. You know, the places, much of the archives in Germany, I mean, Germany has been devastated by two wars. Europe has been devastated by two wars. So it's recognized that it is very undercounted. First of all, sometimes, for example, in Scotland, uh, you have things as witches were burnt. It doesn't say how many. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of that. But even so, we also have to see that these were much smaller population. Right? So proportionally, it's yes. an enormous number. So proportionally, it is an enormous number. It's not a number as big as the number of people who were enslaved. Right? But on the other hand, imagine the impression of having women burned publicly and everybody has to be present publicly having them burned. And the knowledge that they were burnt after months and months of torture, right? So it's a very, very big operation. You also write that the, the geography mm -hmm. of this official violence against women, that it reveals important things about 
the political contours, the political right. economic contours of the, right. the persecution. Because in England, right. you write that it was concentrated in Essex, where land yeah. had been enclosed right. and privatized, but that the witch hunt did not happen in Ireland. Mm -hmm. Right. Or and in Scotland, in the Highlands, in the Western Highlands, in Scotland, the witch hunts are concentrated in the eastern part of the country, and particularly the lowland, which is the area that was close to England, and that already being monetized, was already part of a monetary economy. Whereas in the Western Highland, where you still have the commons, the clans, etc., you don't have the, you know, and Scotland was one area of great, great concentration, yeah, of, of witch hunts. So, and then in Europe, you see the beginning of the witch hunt you know, the, the area where it begins in a way almost overlaps with the area of the peasant wars, right? And then in France, also the area where you have more heresy, mm -hmm. heresy, peasant war. So it's a whole, and peasant struggle, this, the beginning. And again, three centuries, in three centuries, from being a predominantly rural phenomenon, moves to the city, from being a phenomenon that is always described as collective, you know, the witches is a sect. After a century, the witch, witchcraft is an individual crime. There is also the witch, right? Rather than the collective of witches. Very interesting, the change, because the society will themselves change. So from a collective crime, it becomes more individual crime. Right? Also, what the crimes itself is about. Because at the beginning, a lot of the crime has to do with killing animals. It had to do with raising storms and destroying the crops, and also killing children. Children, animals, and crops. Later on, more and more sexuality, etc. Right? So, it's very interesting to... I don't think that kind of work has been done enough. This is part of the things that I'm trying now to build with these other women. We are really trying to do a study of the witch hunt from below with the question that we as women would ask, not just the historian, mostly men, but we would, you know, that we want to know. This is Sarah Jaffe, and you are listening to The Dig with Daniel Denver, my favorite podcast for thoughtful discussions on the U.S. left and beyond, and you can support it on Patreon.com. This episode of The Dig is brought to you by our listeners who support us at Patreon.com and by Verso Books, which has loads of great left-wing titles, perfect for Dig listeners like you. One that you might like is Edward Said, his thought as a novel by Dominique Ede. In this personal portrait of Edward Said written by a close friend, Dominique Ede offers a fascinating and fresh presentation of his work, from his earliest writings on Joseph Conrad to his most famous texts, Orientalism and Culture and Imperialism. Ede weaves together accounts of the genesis and content of Said's work his intellectual development, and her own reflections and personal recollections of their friendship, which began in 1979 and lasted until Said's death in 2003. Throughout, she traces the connection between personal history and theoretical options, illuminating the evolution of Said's thought. Both specialists of Said's work and newcomers will find much to learn in this rich portrait of one of the 20th century's most important intellectuals. Edward Said, His Thought as a Novel, by Dominique Ede, out now from Verso Books. When one mode of production is supplanted by mm -hmm. another, you write, quote, the metaphysical underpinnings of the social order must be transformed. Yes. And quote, at the basis of magic was mm -hmm. an animistic conception of nature right. that did not admit to any separation between matter and spirit and thus imagined the cosmos as a living organism. 
populated by occult forces. What obstacles did magic pose to the rise of capitalism and its rationalization of the human body and of time, yeah. causation, nature, work? And, and how, what role did the witch hunt play in criminalizing activities that previously had been normal? Mm -hmm. And what role did that play in disenchanting mm. Europe and thus paving the yeah. way for the rise of capitalism? Yeah, well, first of all, the question of, uh, you know, nature, the control of a nature, you know, you, the, the exploitation of nature requires that you look at nature as a purely physical machine, right? That's where the matter in motion, because the moment you admit the nature has its needs, its desires, its, um, even, uh, even if you don't impute the same subjectivity, then it becomes a problem, right? Like uh, I described for a long, long time, people had that this qualitative relation to the days. There are days that are good to work, days that you're not supposed to work. You know, the good days, the lucky and unlucky days, it goes back to the Roman, right? Imagine, you cannot have that. So time has to become uniform. Space has to become uniform. You cannot have a differentiated if you want to, to maximize the exploitation of time and space, right? For instance. And secondly, if you want to, you know, exploit nature, for example, the prohibition against mining. If you think of nature, you know, and, and the earth as a mother, Pachamama, right? And then mining becomes a form of murder because you're inflicting wounds into the body of your mother. And in fact, presumably there were taboos, big, big taboos against mining in, for a long, long time into the 15th century. You know, so you have to win that over. You have to show that no, there is no spirit in nature. There is no soul. Nature is soulless. Anima, right? Animism comes from anima. Anima means soul, right? The soul of the world. Spinoza, pantheism. You know, the world is a living organism. Therefore, uh, you have to approach on the basis of equality, right? So the capitalism creates a hierarchy, not only among people, but also human and nature. Nature is the subject, right? Nature is an object, it's not a subject, right? So nature is there to serve us. And uh, An irony here is that this is done in the name and part of like scientific yes. rationalism, but as we know, given the ecological crisis that we're mm -hmm. facing today, these, uh, you know, pre-modern uh, cosmologies mm -hmm. are, are far more scientifically far more. accurate. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Gaia, the Gaia hypothesis, mm. right? That basically understands that there is a whole complexity, you know, the rhizomatic concept of trees. The trees actually speak to each other. They give each other direction. So they're all moving towards this way or they way according to the wind, the humidity and the sun because they are in some ways, they are forms of communication. We are beginning to understand that. That's going back to a very old conception. You know, the nature is not brute matter, you know, but has reasons within it and has a life that has been, and it's a system where it's a common because birds, winds and so on, all contribute to the life of the system. You know, it's not an aggregate of, of mechanical gadgets, you know, which is what we are, we are told. So, and, you know, it's like now the bodies look like a, an aggregate, you know, the self is gene. The genes are all supposed to be all separate, right? So like now the DNA, well, it's like, it's absolutely crazy. It's absolutely crazy. The gene has a wrong program, right, and doesn't, care about the rest of the body, the environment, she has her own. And now you have the, just recently, 10 days ago, they had the, the institute, the national center for whatever, saying that women should all have 
a genetic screening to figure out if you have this BRCA, which is the bad gene that gives you breast cancer. So can you imagine millions of women are going to have to go to these very expensive tests, and then you'll have the mammogram. And whereas it's obvious that it's all environmental, that cancer is weird an environmental disease. So I think it's like the doctrine of predestination. If there is an original sin, now it's the gene, the bad gene that is going to influence your body, right? It's going to be there, and one day it's going to emerge and shape and send you to die. It's like it really predestination. But nowadays the doctor is going to take care and cut the gene, gene editing. Oh, it's like, it's, I don't know, all that story to me is like uh, hallucinatory, hallucinatory. This whole division between yeah. between scientific rationalism yeah. and and magic, you write about that a yes. lot in your book, and you write that the witch hunt was not yeah. quote the last spark of a dying feudal world. No, but many men who are today considered to be the founders of scientific yeah. rationalism cheered on the witch hunt. In in Leviathan, Hobbes wrote quote I think not that their witchcraft is any real power, but yet that they are justly punished for the false belief they have that they can do such mischief exactly. joined with their purpose to do it if they can. The suppression of the, these beliefs, Hobbes mm -hmm. wrote, would make, quote, men more fitted than they are for civil obedience. Yeah. How is it that perhaps counterintuitively, the witch hunts were in sync with scientific rationalism rather than a holdover from some irrational past that preceded it. I mean, I, th I, think, I think that, that Hobbes was uh, very important, that quote, because it shows the politics of the witch hunt. It really shows that it was whether they believed or not. It, it didn't matter. Obviously, they didn't believe that witches could do. If they could kill them, obviously, they will witches did not have all these powers that they were attributing to them. It's very obvious, right? But they killed them to educate a whole population as to what was permissible and not permissible. So the witch hunt, but then said it, you know, kill many, kill many women to educate a few. And so the witch hunt is a pedagogical, you know, it's what is happening today. In fact, when I go to Latin America, places like Colombia or Brazil, where there's a lot of women are being murdered now in the rural area, women who are working in, um, you know, movement against mining, you know, against the privatization of land against the poisoning of the waters, and they are being murdered by paramilitary, so-called narco-traffickers, or by the army. Many, many feminists are making the connection with the witch hunts because they are not only killed, but their tortured body are left out publicly. It's like the burning of the witch has to be public. It has to be public. You know, it's a lesson. It's a pedagogical tool. It's a terror campaign that is sending a message. You know, it's not punishing person for the crime committed. It's it's a it's a campaign that has an educational purpose. That is supposed to change very spread, deeply ingrained, culturally ingrained forms of behavior. And so that's what the witch hunt does. With terror, it's a form of terror that as a pedagogical aim, in the same way that today, these murder women's bodies that are left out, like in Chudá Juárez. Chudá Juárez was a place of great organizing in the early 80s, you know, in the 70s, late 80s, late 70s, early 80s, where women were organizing against the maquila. Then they begin to be killed. And the bodies are always left out. They are tortured. And they are left out. Why they are left out? You murder, you want to hide the body. No, but now, now that's the new, the new norm. The body of the, of the woman mutilated, 
half burn has to be left out. So it's it's a pedagogical. There's a pedagogical uh, element to it. Does this pedagogical element force us to rethink what's being accumulated via primitive accumulation? Yeah, there is an accumulation. Yeah, absolutely accumulated and disaccumulated, right? Because uh, together with with the terror, it right, comes the amnesia. It comes the separation. It comes the fear. It comes the desocialization. There is a desocialization. For example, from the community of women to the woman who now is with the husband, with the man, and she only thinks of the husband and the man. She's not any longer with the community of women. Or her base, her social life is not around all these other women she was working with all day, right? But now it's the nuclear family, right? It's it's a whole new situation. And in in uh, in this booklet that I published recently, I I speak of the change in the concept, the the, the meaning of gossip, the word gossip, that used to mean female friend, my close friend. You see, I went out with my gossip. And then changes in two centuries becomes a derogatory gossip. It's like no knowledge, no real communication, backbiting. It's the know? stigmatization yeah. of ordinary of ordinary communicate private yeah. communication yeah. between it's women. Stigmatization of solidarity among women of effective relation among women, the stigmatization of the women's community, of the women's commons, right? Of solidarity among women. And so it's like, you don't want to be seen with other women because they're going to think you're a witch, because you're going to be seen as a gossip. I mean, this is the period they put, they put the, the bridal, the cage, on the women's face. Can you imagine? The muzzling of women is also physical. The period of the witch hunt is also the period on women who had a long tongue, the tongue of women who spoke too much. They would put this thing that prevented them from talking because it was a metal cage, either leather or metal, and it had a tongue that went into, it was a tongue that kept this down and it had a spike in the middle. So if you try to talk, your tongue will be lacerated. People have forgotten. I'm trying to, to remind people who we are. We are the product of a long history of torture. And, and I understand when you say, well, black women, for example, now say, oh, we have a whole different, you know, white women. But actually, what they have done to proletarian white women was also very atrocious. Not as atrocious by any means as what was done to women who were enslaved. But when you see what was done, the burning of women alive, the, the way they'll be, and then with that on, you'll be driven all around the community to show the other women, right? With, 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 the, with the leash, like a dog. In Scotland, in 16th century Scotland, they'll put this thing the wife that spoke too much, the woman, the woman who, who fought against enclosure, women who fought against enclosure, who be put, they put them in this cage, and then they would driven them around the community with the leash, like a dog. It is, and then of course the word gossip changes, right? So you're terrorized if you you know, if you are with other women, the solidarity, because immediately you, you may be looked upon as a witch, and that's dangerous. So you, you, you're now afraid of being seen with other women, whereas you had a very intense relation with other women. It's right? dividing men against yeah. women, but also women yeah. from each other. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and yet the, the witch hunt ultimately gets rebranded as this atavistic, non-political, yes. medieval, irrational yeah, holdover that's within supplanted by... the by... 18th century, the world, of the, the world that... Uh, Pose the danger, right? By the 18th century, is a new world. And the heirs to the witch hunters also, yeah, project the witch hunt mm-hmm. onto this, oh, yeah, this, this distant past. Oh, this is the church. 
Yeah. Oh, this is uh, the Enlightenment. This is the Church, and this. Is, but think of what happened in those two centuries, right? The witch hunt begins fifteen something, and even a little earlier, but with fifteen, and then what happens? Colonization, America, gold, this. By by the time you have 1750, 1730, when the witch hunt really is ended, and when you begin to have the other history, right? The new, you are in another world. Is a world that now capitalism controls completely. Is a world where great wealth has been accumulated. Great wealth, all the gold and silver from the Americas. It's a world where you know nature is being subdued. Yeah, where huge territories have, are now sending gold, sending minerals, sending you know madeira, um, wood, sending uh, spices. You know, it's all flow. Rum, cotton, corn, right? It's it's another world. So the world of the witches, yeah, and people are disciplined. There is a discipline. There is the vagabonds have been enclosed. The workhouse, the first factories are beginning in eighteen hundred. It's a different world, and so there is no more. There is no more danger. The kind of world, you know, which had to be destroyed and was destroyed also through the burning of the witches. And that's the, the precondition. The world was destroyed. Yeah. That's the precondition for right. this Victorian ideal right. exactly. of women as subordinate, yet oh, yeah. morally yeah. superior oh, yeah. oh, and yeah. full-time yeah. housewife kind yeah. of setup. They're morally superior in the sense that they, they, they accept sacrifice, that they set the moral, they discipline the man, you know, they, they embody the, the capitalist virtues. And that's only possible because the of the genocide process. of the witch right. hunt. Exactly, exactly. So I'm saying that the new kind of woman, even the new names that are given to women, right? Modesta, modest, right? And so on. there's a whole prudence. Yes. There's a whole new way of calling women. It's no longer Kate and so on, but it's modest, prudence. And so. <laughs> the kind of now asexual woman. So you go from the woman who is all sex, the, the witch is the woman who is, she's so sexual that she even copulates with the devil, to the completely desexualized woman of the Victorian period. Now, how they do, do that? Yeah, they, they, they burn women at the stake. They terrorize you. They, they put this, the thing. Or the woman who doesn't talk. The woman of the Middle Ages, a woman of course, is a woman of gets into the brawl, is a woman who beats up men, is a woman, right? The woman is like, let's say, terrorized. Is a woman is terrorized. It's horrible. That's, it's a horrible story. Your book is deeply disturbing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And now we have the image of the witch, the kind of cartoon, yeah, oh, as the God. Halloween survival, oh, which I, now, I can never look at the same way the, after the women, reading your there's book. There's a new women's movement who is trying to use again the witch in a, in a good sense. And the women are saying, we are all the granddaughters of all the witches that you were not able to burn. This has now become an international story. We are the granddaughters. Somos las nietas de todas las bruas que no pudiste quemar. No, some of us need us. I, I want, this is being repeated over and over and over. There is an old attempt to recuperate that, in fact, that's a whole story in itself. All these movies they are made in showing that, yeah, there are witches, and the witch is a bad woman. And, the, and as I have a trailer that somebody made for me of all the horrible movies they are making now to attack the feminist use of the witch as a positive figure. And there is one where there is this blonde woman who does, she doesn't know she's a witch, but she has this boyfriend and she makes love with him and he explodes, he explodes, blood, all, and she's all covered with blood and she says, I am a witch. I mean, can you imagine? This is now happening and I go around and I say to women in meeting, why don't you go and pick it? The places where they show this garbage. Why don't you go and pick at them? And they tell me, oh yeah, and there's also TV series. But why, you know, I'm old now and I, well, I'm trying to do my best, but you know, you guys have to do something because I always tell them tomorrow they are going to burn you. 
Yes, I'm serious. I'm, I mean, they will not burn them in the classical way, but it's like women in... The, so many women have been assassinated now in Latin America. Caliban has been receiving major resurgence of interest mm-hmm. in, in mm-hmm. recent in attention in recent years. Mm-hmm. It was was the first publication ninety two thousand and four. Two thousand four. Eh? There was a previous, but it was a very different one. But it had a similar title. It was the the Great Caliban that oh, I did okay. in Italian, right? And that was very different. Although it did have two of the articles that I wrote. I also wrote for that book, uh, the one on the body. But I, in this new ed- edition, they are much more expanded. And and so you know, you travel the world all the time, yeah. speaking to social movement organizers, for whom your yeah. book is very yes. important. Yeah. So my my question is why why now is there such an intensely renewed interest in, in I Caliban? think the question of capital accumulation, land expropriation, and the murders of women is the is this three three question, you know, this new onslaught of the company, the Monsanto, the mines, and this structural adjustment and war, all of that, this primitive accumulation, this return. I think everybody now, when I say primitive accumulation, everybody can connect immediately to the fact that now there is a new massive, I say now, I'm talking about the 90s, the, the, the last 20, 25 years. There is now you know, a massive restructuring of property. Well, the Amazon. What is happening now to the Amazon? Right? You can put that in. Huh? And what is happening with Amazon.com? Oh. Yeah, exactly. So that, you know, particular. And I'm saying all this technology is what is eating the, the is what is eating the trees to produce the technology. You know what a computer? It takes so much water, so much land to to sort out the mineral, to sort out from the soil the minerals. The lithium the, and the rare. The lithium, the rare for the computer. So they are eating the earth. And so everywhere there's a mining camp. Everywhere you go to Mexico, you go to Latin America, everywhere there's a struggle. And at the center of the struggle, massive violence, unprecedented against women. Unprecedented murders of women. You know, we hear about Berta Caceres, we hear about Maria Franco. But in Colombia, for the last six months after the peace accord, I don't know how many women they have killed. I mean, I, 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 we have a, a connected with a whole group of women in Colombia, and we are continuously signing petition of protest for women who have been killed, were involved in some land struggle or in Bonaventura and the, the, the area of the Choco, you know, the, the area of the Quilombo, particularly black women, once descent, yeah. Another thing that resonates a lot from your, your book that I was thinking in terms of the, the the historical story you're telling in the present is the threat posed by by vagabonds. Oh yeah. And looking oh, the evening. Oh, absolutely. And even throughout the 20th oh. century, the rise of mass incarceration as a response yes. to the Black Great Migration absolutely. to absolutely. to the to border militarization and Trump's it's, entire it's like, politics today. Yeah. yeah. Which I'm beginning to see the capitalism is a kind of closed universe in the sense closed that certain strategies are always there. You see them returning, of course, with new forms, with new character, but basically the fundamental, like land expropriation, right? the creation of vagabonds, and then the criminalization of the people that they have expropriated. First, they kick you out. First, they take away the means of survival, and then they criminalize you because you're still trying to survive. You're still trying to survive no matter what. And then they criminalize you because you still try to survive, even though they have deprived you of everything, just because you don't accept to simply, you know, lay down at, at the, and, and die, <laughs> and you fight back, or, or you steal, or you make a movement, and then they criminalize you. It's such a, it's a the, the, the ferocity of this system, but it's a system that is very, you know, I. I I will not use the word, I will not honor it using the word intelligent, but these assistants who have learned a lot because the way they've been able to decentralize 
and how do you say, to sectorialize the torture, the exploitation. So you can live in some area where everything, where the world looks perfect, no? Or where the world looks quite decent, right? And then you have hell, and then you have in between. And then, so people know everything about the horror. I mean, I listen to democracy now. Every day is a tale of, the horror is out there, and yet it does not produce what you'd imagine you produce. You, you hear stories, not only about the present, but about the past. This pro the project that became Caliban began in the, mm -hmm. the 70s as part of a project of developing a, a position critical of both radical feminists mm -hmm. who asserted that women's oppression was due to trans-historical yeah. forces, and then socialist feminists who viewed women's oppression mm -hmm as being rooted in their ex their exclusion from capitalist labor right. relations and, and thus patriarchy being a kind of feudal vestige. How has feminism changed over the years in your view from the this, this moment in the 70s and the debates you were engaged in then through today? It's a hard complicated question because on some level I think there's more readiness to accept an analysis of capitalism and also the different forms of women's exploitation right, that traces the, exploit the specific form of exploitation of women to a capitalist uh, organization of work. Right? Because I think that over the last 30, 40 years, both in the United States and internationally, you know, the devastation caused by capitalist relation in the environment, in the organization of work, precarization of life, the rise of debt, privatization of everything, every asset, urban space. So there's more, there's more readiness to, to, to look for the factors that have to do with capital exploitation. Certainly this is very true, particularly in Latin America, where the whole issue of land expropriation, impoverishment, massive impoverishment to structural adjustment, disinvestment by government into, into the reproduction of the communities. Right? So I think in that sense, it's much easier the, the, the argument, you know, patriarchy is more abstract. It's, it's less, um, mm. on the other hand, to me, I see as uh, problematic the, the impact that has been made by all these post-structuralist uh, theories, post-modern, post-structuralist, the butler, genderist performance, and so on that I find have had a very problematic consequences. So more and more you find obviously very younger generation people saying it's all the binary, yeah? So there's, among the youngest, youngest generation, there is uh, less of an attention to issues of work and to issue of uh, political economy. And now there is the new easy road, it's the binary, right? And so what in some ways could it be an important critique of sexual you know, dimorphism of, of uh, you know, the, the imposition of gender identification. It's also become a shortcut. And I hope, I hope it's a short-lived fashion. <laughs> and that's not even touching on, on liberal Feminism, yeah, which is no. arguably oh, more liberal dominant, feminism. Right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Liberal feminism. That, that's what I call state feminism. It's the feminism. It's the recreation of feminism by the World Bank and by the United Nations. I call it United Nations. I don't even, I feel almost uncomfortable calling it feminism, but it is. It is. It's, Le lean it's in a feminism. New, yeah, institutional state feminism. Yeah. That's, uh, and corporate. And corporate feminism, yeah.
absolutely. She and that's what I think is uh, very much, you know, discredited also a feminist perspective because now it's the dominant one, you know, and, and very often among the new generation, they think that that's all there is. You know, they think that that's all there is. And all there's been, that what has been is this kind of liberal feminism about, you know, equality with men, climbing the ladder, breaking the, the ceiling, the breaking of the ceiling, etc. They think that that's all there is, that that's what feminism is. It's less true in Latin America. You know, in Latin America, there's not, there's not, there's a popular feminism. That's what they call popular feminism. Mi cuerpo, mi territorio, the issue of violence, the issue of land, the connection with the land, and of the woman is curandera. There is, um, there is a very different relationship to feminism. Yeah, having been at both the Women's March in yeah. D.C. and mm -hmm. in the recent Santiago Women's yeah, March it's this very year, different, I just yeah, the the the, the median mm -hmm. person's militancy mm -hmm. <laughs> was very yeah. different. Oh yeah. Um, not that there weren't many left forces present no. at the Women's March here, but no. it felt like a pervasively left oh. militant yeah. march in Santiago. Yeah, yeah. But also, the women, the creativity. And the, what do you say, subversive character of, of the creative and subversive character of uh, feminism in Latin America is something else. Uh, in Argentina, I, so many things, so many things. I mean, going to the demonstration and seeing is such a pleasure, you know, and it's so rich. And the irony and the the slogan. The posters are great. The posters <laughs> and on the body, and um, you know, Abort in the La Plata, <laughs> in La Plata, women have built a huge vagina like this, and they have brought it in a procession, like the way the Virgin is brought, very openly, in a place that is. Argentina with Papa Francesco, you know, Papa Bergoglio, you know, they have their Pope. So Argentina is now completely in the hands of Catholics. Bolsonaro and Brazil with the Pentecostal. Argentina, the Catholic, because they have got the Pope and Bolsonaro. So in places where the, the institution are totally, totally now in mesh. Also for international reasons, the prestige of Argentina. We got the Pope. They will, ne they will never dare do that in the United States. A major point of your argument is that all these hierarchies and, and divisions that put men above women or wage laborers over mm -hmm. enslaved laborers are not ultimately good for either men or wage workers. Yes. But, but, but rather, you argue that these divisions from bo above harm everyone below, for example, in the case of women, the, de the devaluation of reproductive work also devalues that work's product, Absolutely. labor power. Absolutely. So to finish, to close, what is your analysis of the position of, I don't know, I suppose socially valorized workers under capitalism and how has and should the left convince for example, white people and men, that fighting racism and sexism is indispensable to their own yes. liberation. And how can these points of division be transformed into points of connection and solidarity? Yeah, yeah it seems to me that the history of the last 50 years is very instructive because uh, you know, the moment in which you have a working class and let's just take the United States, not to go beyond, but you have a working class that is really beginning to develop enough power, you know, to also go beyond the kind of uh, rigid model that was instituted at Bretton Woods, you know, with the Wagner Act, where the unions and, you know, the ritual of the contract, 
more exploitation, a bit more of money, more exploitation, and you, you begin to have that breaks down. And you have begin to have a working class in the United States, in Detroit, you know, the Black Revolutionary League demands the working hour, the working week of 20 hours. And you have really going beyond the union, democratization of the workplace. It's, it's a whole new, the, 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 the early 70s, the, the 60s and 70s were very, very important. Even though you had the hard hats beating up, you know, students protesting the Vietnam War in Wall Street. Nevertheless, there was a revolution going on in the wage workplace, in the factories. There was a struggle. And uh, places like Lordstown. Yeah, I w I w you took the words out of my mouth. They go to the rural area thinking, yeah, Lordstown, these are all bumpkins. And total, total, the after Lordstown, where do they go? They go to the Philippines. You know, they go, they go to the places you know, in which imperialist politics have prevailed, helped by the union. You know, all the major union supported in imperialist politics. Now, workers should have learned from that. This, is, this was the retribution of having supported imperialism, right? That in fact, the, on the popularization, on the popularization of workers, you then have this Austria and on, on uh, you know, the militarization of Latin America, the coups, the death squad, all of it financed directly by the United States. It seems to me what is happening now with migrants, all the, the forms of repression and more intense exploitation are then generalized. It's an illusion to think that when capitalism finds a new mode of uh, you know, exploiting, torturing, disciplining, it only, it only uh, limits its use to the person, to the group for which it was originally intended. It always then becomes generalized. Mass, no. inca mass incarceration yeah. is a perfect example because obviously it, it legitimates itself yeah. through the spectacular hyper, ex hyper incarceration of mm -hmm. black people, yeah. black men. Yeah. But then, but yeah, it, it incarcerates enormous numbers of all sorts of, of Americans. Sorts. Exactly. And it can only do so because of the spectacular mm -hmm. racism yeah, exactly. of it. But the race, but racism is not the entirety of its function. No, because or, they discover a new way. You know, the, the the ruling class also discovers and experiments. There's a constant experimentation, and uh, and I think that the, you know this is the tragedy of this country, how they have been able always to use and then people thinking that they are going to save themselves, you know, by selling out, by selling out their neighbor, and. Uh, that's a disaster. As long as we are like this, it's going to be a total disaster. The more optimistic ending I was nudging you towards <laughs> with uh, the points of division into points of solidarity. Yeah, the more optimistic, I think there's a lot of struggle happening also in this country. You know, I think that, that, I think that there is a, a whole move towards more of a commoning. You know, this is it's still not the dominant form. But there's still a lot of them. I think that there is also a part of the country who realizes that alone you are defeated. And you have to come together with, with other people. You have to come together. And also among the younger generation, for example, some of the demonstrations organized by Black Lives Matter, I've seen a higher number of white people than I've ever seen in the, in, uh, you know, in the last 30, 40 years going to you know, demonstration where to protest, for example, the killing of, of a black youth and so on, right? So I, I no, I'm, I don't want to close on a negative note. And the Sunrise Movement mm -hmm. and yeah. the Bernie Sanders campaign are also, mm -hmm. yeah, it's... Yeah. So there is, there is a lot of motion. And I think uh, that Trump may have miscalculated its, uh, its capacity to silence everybody. And you know, the, there is a moment in there is a moment of euphoria 
but it may be really also in like uh, in England now. Johnson abolishing the parliament for two months. I mean, you see a continuity, yeah? You see a continuity. And I, I wonder how spontaneous that is, that everybody thinks this is the moment. Salvini in Italy, Johnson, Trump, they all everybody said this is the fascist moment. This is the moment that people are not organized, whatever, and we push, push, push. But, well, in Italy, I don't know if you saw it, the Salvini government is broken up. I have no illusion about the new government, right? But uh, three weeks ago, Salvini was saying, broke the government, let's go to the new election. And the campaign slogan was, give me all power. Give me all power and I'll fix Italy. And now he's out. Like this for now he's out. Then in England, now you have Johnson suspending them. So they are making moves that somehow they are like, there's a moment of letting out the masks. But right? they're, but they're, the, over, this, but they're this, overreaching. The, yeah, this dictatorial vocation mm. is coming very open. <laughs> this vocation to our democracy. Yeah, this, but I really hope that, yeah, they are overreaching. Well, Silvia Federici, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks to you. Silvia Federici, feminist theorist and longtime and deeply committed activist. She co-founded the International Feminist Collective in the early 1970s and helped found the Wages for Housework campaign. She is the author of many works, including The New York Wages for Housework Committee, Theory, History, Documents, 1972 to 1977, Revolution at Point Zero, Housework, Reproduction, and Feminist Struggle, Reenchanting the World, Feminism and the Politics of the Commons, and, of course, Caliban and the Witch, Women, the Body, and Primitive Accumulation, from Autonomedia. Thank you for listening to The Dig from Jacobin Magazine. As Marx once said, after noting that the bourgeoisie has torn away from the family its sentimental veil and has reduced the family relation to a mere money relation, while other podcasts have only interpreted the world in various ways, our point is to change it. We are posting new episodes every week. The Dig was produced by Alex Lewis. Music by Jeffrey Brodsky. Our communications coordinator is Julia Rock. Our senior advisor is Theo Rio Francos. Check out our vast archives at thedigradio.com. Follow us on Twitter at The Dig Radio. And please find us wherever you get podcasts and subscribe. Also, wherever that is, leave us a nice review. Those reviews seemingly introduce us to new listeners, but more importantly, what introduces us to new listeners is you telling other people about the show. Please make propaganda for us and do find us on patreon.com and make a monthly contribution to keep this operation going strong. Even a few bucks a month is a big help. Thank you.